Hi, I'm Miss Joy. Welcome to my classroom. Today we're going to be making some face pots. So this one's got snowboarder glasses on. There's a hole in the bottom and we're going to plant some um, probably grass, maybe catnip or some chia. It can be some sort of ivy sticking out, which will be like the hair. Um, there are some lips and nose that stick way out. So we had to go in from behind and carve out so that it wasn't too thick. We have another face pot, which is made from a pinch pot style. This one was a slab style. We're also going to do a coil belt so you can choose your own adventure. We also have one that my niece made. So instead of doing it this way, like you normally would see my other examples, she turned her pinch pot on its side and turned it into an animal. So you, this one is a unicorn. You can tell that it does not have to be a human face. It could be a creature. Um, and so when we build, we're going to make sure that we keep the clay thinner than the thickness of our thumb and thicker than our pinky. So it cannot be thinner than our pinky. It will be too thin. If we pound out a pancake, and we have it be paper thin, it's gonna to be too thin and it can break. If it's thicker than a thumb, it needs to be hollowed out and that means scooping out the insides. So for example, on this one where the nose sticks out really far, you can tell that that is thicker than my thumb. So I went behind and scooped out some clay and then all along the edges, it's no thinner than a pinky and no thicker than a thumb. So follow along with me. We'll see how to make these face pots. And we have already explored the lesson of the rich history behind African face pots. Now we can make a modern version with any sort of face on it that we want. So this is Miss Joy wedging clay and we wedge clay to get rid of the air bubbles. So I'm gonna just cut off a piece here and then show you how you can wedge in your class by dropping the clay. We're not throwing it down. We're not slamming it. We're just picking it up and letting it drop. Turn it, pick it up, and let it drop. Turn it, drop it, turn it, drop it. Do that for anywhere from 75 to 100 times. And that's a good amount of wedging. If you've ever, ever made a snowball, you're gonna be really good at making a clay ball. And it's important to just make sure it's really nice and smooth. Any cracks or lumps and bumps need to be smoothed out, rubbed out before you begin. And the first example we're going to make is called a pinch pot. So we're going to make our hands in the shape of a heart. Can you find the heart there? My thumbs are going to press in and the bottom on my fingers are going to cradle the bottom of the bowl or the pot. So I'm pinching between my thumb and my fingers and I'm squishing it into the shape of a bowl. Now I was measuring to make sure that my pinky and my thumb were following those rules. It's not thinner than a pinky, not thicker than a thumb. Smooth out your clay, make sure all the cracks and lumps and bumps are gone. Make sure that you take the time to do this. It does make a difference. Okay, then what I'm gonna do is put this over a shape. You can use a cup, you can use a bowl. I'm going to put newspaper so that the clay does not stick to what I'm molding it around. And I'm just using a yogurt cup for this. You can put the flat slab, this is called a slab of clay, over the mold and shape it. This needs to set up, that means rest, for about 20 to 30 minutes to hold its shape. Don't forget to put your name on it. So that's what we're doing, our name and our class code. Now, when we come over to the workstation, sometimes teachers let you use a spray bottle, make sure it's not the streaming out, shooting out, it's just fine mist. And instead of that, some teachers may say, just use a water cup and dip your finger in. 
but you can put your finger in and rub over any little cracks, any anything you need to smooth out, but be careful not to add too much water. Water plus clay equals slip. Now this is slip. It's slippery, just like what it sounds like. And very watery clay is slip. So it can be used to smooth things out and fill in cracks, but it also acts like glue. This right now, what I'm doing is called scoring the clay. Scoring is just scratching up the clay. And I'm making tic-tac-toe or hashtags. So you're basically going one direction with your scratches, then the other direction with your scratches. So scratch up the clay wherever you're going to stick some other clay. So if I want to put a foot or a bottom all the way around and I'm going to roll a coil, anywhere that I'm sticking that coil has to be slip and score. The slip, that watery clay, acts like glue and scoring it or scratching it up tears up the clay. And I'm gonna tell you why in a few minutes. So when you're rolling a coil, if you roll too fast, it's gonna to start to go bump, 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 bump. You want to stop and pat it down and slow your roll. Roll nice and slowly and you'll get a nicer coil. So I'm moving my hands from the fingertips down to the palm of my hand, back up to the fingertips, down to the palm of my hand, and I'm kind of moving my hand back and forth. Wherever it's wider or fatter, you need to roll more. If it's thinner, don't roll that much anymore. So that was me checking, measuring to see if it were reached all the way around, but it didn't. So I'm gonna roll my coil out a little bit longer and that means using two hands. So back and forth, back and forth, feeling for wherever it's fatter and rolling more gently there. All right, now we're gonna do the slip and score. I've already scratched up or scored the pot now I'm going to do the coil or the worm that I'm going to attach to the bottom. We're looking at the bottom underneath side of the pot. All right, so sometimes for scratching, you can use a broken comb. Those work really nicely. You can use a fork. I just went to the secondhand store and got these forks and we just only use them for art supplies and clay, not for eating. All right, so it's time to add the slip on top of the scoring. So anytime you're attaching two pieces of clay together, you're slip and scoring. And I'm just patting it around. It's okay, your hands are gonna get dirty. You'll wash them afterwards. And now we're going to turn that so that both of the scratched up sides are facing each other. When you push it down, I'm kind of pinching, but I'm not pinching my fingers too hard together towards each other. They're mostly pressing down towards the pot and attaching that coil onto the clay. And when the slip squishes out the sides, that's a good sign. That means that there's no air inside of it because there's um, a really good attachment. You want those things to attach really well together so that they don't dry up and fall off. I'm scratching and scoring inside where the two coils are gonna meet each other and connect. I'm smushing. We're gonna be doing lots of smushing for this project. And so when we have two sides of the clay, I'm just gonna show you how you want to scratch them up and score them so that they can blend and become one, really attached to each other. Whereas if you don't scratch and slip and score and you just stick things to each other, as they dry out and the water evaporates, they're gonna dry apart from each other. And that's how they can just sort of fall off. 
So if you make an elephant and you want those ears to stay on, you have to slip and score them. If you make the bottom of your bowl or on a face pot, we're gonna be adding ears, nose, maybe a mouth or mustache, eyebrows, sunglasses, whatever you wanna add, you need to make sure that those pieces are really well attached so they don't fall off as it dries. Okay, so I'm just double checking that this is really attached well. I'm gonna smooth up the edges where the slip squished out. And then I'm going to grab a pencil and write my name. So when we take it off the newspaper, we're gonna lose our name because that's where we wrote our name, right? So make sure you're putting your name on the bottom of your pot with the pencil. And don't forget your class code. Miss Joy forgot her class code there. Okay, so I'm going to start to cut off the edge. You can sketch on. I'm pressing with my pencil lightly. And then I'm gonna cut. Some teachers might give you a metal tool to cut with. Some teachers might give you a plastic tool to cut with. We also have wooden tools. There's lots of different types of clay tools and every classroom has different tools. Some teachers have all different tools and they can let you experiment and try, um, but some of them are really sharp and pointy and we might need to wait till middle school to do those. All right, so when I pop this off, it has not been sitting for 20 to 30 minutes like it should have been. So mine gets a little floppy. It's not really gonna hold its shape but this is what it looks like when you do a slab over a mold, all right? So the first example we did was a pinch pot. This is a slab pot with a coil foot. I'm gonna just put this back on the cup because it's not ready to hold its shape yet. It needs some more time to harden and dry into shape. Any of these methods you choose to build with, whether it's a pinch pot or a slab build or a coil pot, all of these will need to be smoothed out. And I want you to take your time and do your best work on this. Smoothing out any cracks, any holes, gouges, it's really important. So I actually spent a whole hour smoothing out this pot. So when I say take your time and do your best work, I'm not joking. It might take you just a whole class of smoothing out your pot, all right? You won't even have time to build on any face yet. You're creating the base structure and that's really important to take your time and make it so nice. Now, if you're going to use this for food afterwards, like hot cocoa, ice cream, anything needs to be food safe glaze. If your teacher's not going to be glazing this and you're going to be painting it instead, then it would only be decoration, not for food or dishwasher or oven or microwave. If your teacher has glaze and you're able to put some food in it and use it to drink out of or eat out of, then you need to really pay attention to if there's any holes that's going to be where food can get into and it's hard to wash those little cracks there the food can kind of hang out in those little areas and get bacteria so if you have a hole where the wall the side meets the bottom the floor you're going to want to smooth that out so i'm going to show you my trick is adding a coil on the inside of that where the side or the wall meets the bottom or the floor. 
And I add that coil there to make it a little bit more rounded out. So when I go to wipe it out with a sponge, I'm talking about after it's glazed, after it's fired, and I'm washing it out, then everything's going to feel really smooth with my sponge. Okay, did anyone spy me using my pinky and my thumb to make sure I wasn't getting it too thin or too thick? As you work, it's important to keep checking. Make sure it's not getting too thin. That's dangerous. When you use too much water, it can also get really floppy and try to spread out. So every once in a while, you have to kind of squish it back in and make sure that it's building up, not out. All right, so like I said, it's gonna take more than one class to do this. And after you've done all this nice smoothing out, we don't want it to dry up, especially over a weekend. We need to wrap it in wet paper towel. So you can get the paper towel or newspaper wet and wring it out really, really well so it's not dripping. It should not be sopping wet. Wrap it especially around the top lip of the cup. That tends to dry out the fastest. Then bag it. I'm actually gonna double bag me, mine because I have to wait over the weekend. Then we're gonna put tape with our name and our class code so we can find it. And when we come back to school, it will be soft enough to work with and attach things to instead of being all dried out and having to start all the way over again. Now, when you get your stuff out and you start working the next class, keep all that right nearby you because you're going to reuse that bag and that wet, damp newspaper or paper towel and your tape with your name, you're gonna reuse all of that at the end of this class. So do what you need to do to smooth it back out and get it ready for building a face. Before I move on and show you the face on this, I'm going to show you one more method of how to make a pot. So this one started as a slab around a mug or a yogurt cup. And then I ended up doing a lot of pinching. So it's kind of a pinch pot and a slab. Many times we end up combining the techniques of coil, slab, and pinch. And because of that, I'm going to show you some other techniques. So we're gonna see how to do a different type of slab, not one that we drape over a mold, but one that we roll into a mug. So I'm wiping off all the stuff off my fingers and sort of making space for myself and going to roll out or pat out a slab. Then we're going to roll up the slab and you're gonna notice me do a slip and score to attach the two pieces together. All right, let's move all this stuff out of the way. Do you notice that I'm keeping everything on top of newspaper? That makes sure that it does not stick to the table. All right, here's a slab that I cut into a rectangle. Then I roll it up into a cup and slip and score. Pinch it together. So now we're doing slab and pinch. And then we're going to do another slab for the bottom. We're going to need to slip and score that together. But first, we smooth. Notice my measuring. It's not thicker than a thumb or thinner than a pinky. Then I trace around the bottom. If I had a bigger slab, I would trace and cut it out, but the pancake that I made was almost a perfect size, so I didn't have much to cut off. Now I'm slipping and scoring. You're gonna notice that's a pattern here, slipping and scoring every time you're attaching two pieces. 
All right, set it on top. I'm gonna do some smoothing from the bottom up to make the base and the sides combine into one piece. There might be some big chunks to cut off, but for the most part, it was a good fit. Okay, lots of smoothing. My finger is deep inside the cup to support from the back side. Now I'm going to show you a third option. This is coil building. And you'll notice that if I keep a sloppy work area, I end up with chunks in my coil. Those chunks of dried clay in your coil or in your clay will mess you up. So keep your workspace clean. I'm working on top of newspaper, not directly on the table, because the newspaper will help your clay not stick to the table. I'm patting down my uh, coil because it started to get bigger in one space and thinner in another space, and I wanted to try and make it even. Next, I'm going to make the bottom. So I'll have a base slab and I'm gonna use that to build my coil on top of. So the cup or the mug in this example is going to be coil built. Now, is this thicker than a thumb? Yes, I need to pat it down more. Now, is it as thin as a pinky? If so, we're perfect. Now, use your newspaper to help you flip it up and that makes it stay really nice and smooth. All right, we're going to mark where we think we need to cut it. You can use a um, something circle to trace if you want to. I held the yogurt cup up to it to trace the circle. And now I'm cutting off all the extra. Perfect size pancake for the bottom. It doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to be doing a lot of smushing. So there's like some pieces that weren't cut all the way off. That's okay. All of that's going to get um, smushed in the end when we go to smooth it out. Scoring. Scratching up the coil. Slip. Then when I start to push down... I'm not pinching my fingers towards each other. I'm pinching them just to hold the coil and I'm pushing down towards the bottom. I'm adding more slip and score when the coils touch each other. I'm going to build coil on top of coil on top of coil. Okay, so I'm going to make another coil after this. I'm just laying one coil on top of another coil. And then when I run out, I just have to move this to the side and make another coil. So if I'm rolling my coil too fast and it starts to bump, 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 I need to do two things. Pat it out and then roll slower. So you'll watch me stop because I got a little bumpy on my coil. I'm going to stop and start tapping it just like I'm doing now. All right, check it. Make sure it's not thicker than a thumb or thinner than a pinky. All right, now we have to slip and score some more. I'm going to add another ring. So I'm building my pot up taller with another coil. And I'm going to be careful not to squish the coils that are underneath it. I'm just going to push it hard enough that I am attaching those two pieces. Now, coils, if you don't attach them properly, as they dry, they'll start to separate from each other. So make sure you're not only slipping and scoring, but you're really pressing those two coils together. You can see how the coils are separate, but at the end, I'm going to smooth them all together and no one will be able to tell whether you used coil building, slab building, or pinch pot. Okay, you're gonna take your time and smooth it out as best as you can. 
Use as little water as possible so that it doesn't become slippery and squishy and soggy and collapse. Now, don't forget to put your name on. Miss Joy forgot her class code, didn't she? When I'm using the pencil, there's a little ball of clay that gets on the tip of the pencil. And so I am rolling it on my hand to wipe off that ball of clay. And then you get a much better, cleaner writing in the clay. Okay, so we're gonna do our best to smooth it out. Now we're going back to the slab pot, smoothing it out. And then the one that's on the table was the coil pot. Okay, so no matter what you do, you're gonna have a lot of smoothing to do. As you smooth, just use your fingers and thumbs as much as you can. Don't use too much water. It'll make it soggy. All right, so I've gone back to the first pot that I liked the best. I am pushing in for some eye areas, just kind of starting to mark out with my fingers where I want things to be, and then pushing out for the nose area. Now this is the one my niece made, which is a unicorn, and you can see how she turned it on its side. I am going to make mine up and down. You see it on the table right there. And some of her spots, ears and, and horn and eyelashes are not thicker than a pinky. So just beware that those can easily break off if they're too thin. Okay, so um, this is what we're going to be making for the face on the first one. And I, as I work, I like to kind of come up with a personality and think about what this goofy character might be like. This, to me, in my mind, was a, a silly, goofy guy. Um, a lot of people have a hard time with the nose, so I'm going to show you really closely how to do the nose and the eyes. All right, so I'm getting the two eyeballs the, about the same size. I had to pinch some off and then roll it up smooth, slip and score. When you do the eyes, you start by pushing in to the pot to make the area that sinks back into the skull, the eye socket, and then slip and score on the eyeball. The next thing we're going to do is roll a little tiny coil, and that's going to be its eyelid. All right, so I'm doing a nice attachment job with the eyeballs, and checking to make sure I haven't squished it too thin as I work on it. It's still a good thickness. All right, scratch and score. Now I've added a plump nose and I'm gonna come back and clean it up. So I'm adding some and then I'm gonna remove some. When you're carving and you're sculpting, when you add clay on, it's called additive. And when you remove clay, it's called reductive carving. So just like in math, when you're in mathematics and you do adding, you're making two things go together to make something bigger. So you're adding on clay. Then when you reduce or you subtract, you reduce means take away or make smaller. So you can see how I'm making some of the eyeball smaller. I'm reductive sculpting right now when I remove chunks of clay. And you're going to notice Miss Joy do both additive and reductive carving. So I'm just kind of supporting from the inside while I work on the outside. See how my finger is behind the eye there so I didn't collapse the shape of my bowl? You're gonna notice that a lot of times when I'm working to press things on from the outside, I'm also holding from the inside at the same time. I'm going to attach a little bit Oh, well, here, let's poke some eyes so you can see 
which way he's looking and make more sense of it while I do this. This is not an eyebrow. This is the eyelid. And it makes the eyes look like they're um, more three-dimensional and that they're actually built into his head. By doing first the eyeball and then the eyelid, it's giving it a lot more um, human-looking quality. Then I'm going to smooth out that eyelid. So when I do the eyebrow, I'm going to make my worm or my coil smaller on the outside because eyebrows are thicker towards the middle and thinner towards the outside. When I did the eyelid, it was thinner on both ends of my worm. So thin, thick, thin on the eyelid. On the eyebrow, it just went thick to thin. All right, now I drew on with my pencil where the nostril is. I'm drawing on some hairs for the eyebrow. I want you to look at lots of cartoon eyebrows. You can get very, very expressive with the eyebrows. You can make them curve up, you can make them curve down. You could make one go higher and one go lower. Make him look like he's kind of raising one eyebrow at you going, hmm? So eyebrows are very expressive. All right, then we want to match what we did on one side with the other side. And that's always a little challenging, but even on real people, we are not perfectly symmetrical on both sides. We are sort of matching, sort of symmetrical, but not perfectly, perfectly equal. So it's okay if the sides are not exactly matching. So now for the nose, I want to describe the nose more. First thing I did was push out from my pot. And then I put a ball of clay in the middle. Then I took my two thumbs to make the nostril and I pushed two little nose holes from the bottom, almost like I was picking his nose. Shh, don't tell anyone. Then I took the pencil and made a C shape and a backwards C shape to really outline where the nostril meets the face. Okay, now I'm adding the eyelid, really smushing it down, making it look like it blends into his face, but it overlaps the eyeball like it does on a real human. I'm gonna go back in and clean some of that away. We call that reductive carving and clean some of that up. I have just too much clay there. It's just bulky, so I'm gonna remove some of that. And sometimes when I'm picking it up and moving it around, I accidentally poke other places on his face. I um, may have accidentally smushed his nose and had to rebuild the whole thing, but I don't make you watch that whole part. All right, so um, his nose has a kind of a bulb or a ball in the top and then two little balls on the sides. So one little ball for a nostril and another little ball for a nostril. So there were three balls that I used to build the nose. Now you're gonna notice the worm for the eyebrow, how it's thicker on one side and thinner on the other side. See if you can spy what I did for that. Don't forget your slip and score. Now, since these are smaller face pots, I was trying to figure out if I had room for a mouth or just a mustache. I didn't want to put a mouth and a mustache if it was going to be too squished. And in this situation, I chose only doing a must mustache. And I must ask you a question. Oh, I'm picking his nose. Okay, I'm adding his mustache, slip and score, 
two worms. One worm for one side, one worm for the other side. And then after I squish it on and shape it and smoosh it into place, then I'm going to take the pencil and make those little hair lines just like I did on the eyebrows. Sometimes I add the slip on the coil or the worm and sometimes I add the slip on the face or the pot. It doesn't matter which one you do. Okay, I'm making sure it's really well attached before I do any of the design work. All right, now if I get too much clay stuck on the end of the pencil, I twist it off on my hand and I'm just using the side of the pencil. I'm not even really using the point very much. Um, see how I use the side to kind of swipe away right here. So friends, thank you for staying with me for this whole video. I know it was a long one. And I want you to think creatively about ways that you can add to your face pot to make it unique. You could think about cat ears. You could think about um, human ears. You could think about a tail. Um, just make sure that if your pieces are sticking out, they're more likely to break off. And if they're thinner than a pinky, they're more likely to break. This is um, a candle holder that I made and I have a combination of oak leaves and holly leaves on his face. And I carved holes through on either side of his eye so that when I put a candle inside and um, it glows through here. So I'll just go slowly spin around. My inspiration for this was a poem and there were some birch trees in the poem and there was some ivy in the poem so I made sure to do some little squiggles for the ivy and here and this was slab rolled. And then I made these leaves also out of slab and I carved after they were all attached. And so that's one face pot I wanted to show you. And here is some inspiration of the ones that have plants growing out of their hair, out of their head, which I think are super cute, um, which is also unique compared to the face pot mugs. So some of these face pot mugs were just inspiration I found online and they were not made by myself. I just found them when searching for ideas to show you for this lesson. And I wanted you to see how some very, very talented professional artists take, um, take their time, do lots of detail, and then some are more simple. Um, very smooth with um, cartoonish type features. Some have facial hair, big teeth, lots of different shapes of mouths, noses, eyes. Um, and so you can get really expressive. Don't forget to change the shape of your eyebrows to make it more animated. And remember, that they don't all have to be human faces either. Here's a cute robot face mug.